Do you have a spare NAS at home? Spare capacity and some bandwidth? And you want to make some money out of it? Let's find out how. As always, if you find the content useful and interesting, please subscribe. Alternatively, do leave me a comment. Otherwise, let's get straight into it. Recently, I came across this new startup called Tardigrade IO. What they're selling is a cloud-based S3 storage, very much like Amazon S3 and Google S3. The use case for the storage is very much similar like everybody else um, for cloud native workloads, for backup targets, a cloud tier or long-term archive, or even a multimedia file. So based on what I see on the website, they are claiming that they are half the price of what Amazon S3 is offering and also about half the price of what Google is offering. So where's the part that you actually can make some money out of? Um, I'll come to that in a while, but let's talk about the backend that powers Tardigrade IO. So Tardigrade IO is powered by storage.io. Yes, you read it right. It's not store J, but pronounced storage. Effectively, what Storage.io does is an application or collective of capacity globally that you and I contribute to form the larger backbone that makes up Tardigrade IO. We can contribute as little as 500 gig to maybe 10 terabytes. It's really up to you how much do you actually want to contribute. So in effect, there's actually two companies at play. So there's Tardigrade IO and Storage.io. So Tardigrade IO is more targeted at consumers or organizations that want to consume S3 as a storage. But at the back end, it's powered by Storage.io, like I mentioned. And this bunch is where they are paying people like you and me to contribute storage. So how exactly do you get paid? They actually have a fairly nifty calculator that goes through exactly um, a rough estimate of how much do you contribute and how much you would get paid on a month-to-month -month basis. How much you get paid is highly dependent on the amount of capacity that you contribute and amount of bandwidth as well as a repair bandwidth that you contribute. And that makes up the sum or the total that you get on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis rather. Bandwidth simply means the outbound traffic that you contribute to the network and repair simply means that you are contributing data sets to repair failed uh, devices or failed nodes across the cluster in Tardigrade. So let's look at how storage actually works in the backend. So assuming a piece of data comes in from the user, it goes into the cloud, and within the store, storage cloud, it gets broken down into 80 chunks. So it doesn't really matter how big a data set is, it could be 10 gig, uh, 1 meg, 8 megs, it just gets broken down to 80 and then shipped to 80 different locations. Oh, I actually forgot that this 80 chunks, while it's broken down into 80 chunks as well, it is also encrypted. So you can pretty much be sure the data is fairly secure. There's no way you can actually piece this 80 chunks together because they're all disparate. And the only person that knows of this location of the 80, data, 80 pieces of data is actually the user itself. And this is all based on a blockchain uh, algorithm and key that only the user has. So naturally with distributed system like this, and of course, a lot of this uh, host are hosted by people like you and me, potentially not enterprise grade or do not actually have an enterprise data center, failures are fairly common. So assuming in this case, I take multiple failures and of course you can't actually guess this because there's so many users around the world. How do the network actually deal with failure? So storage uses a backend erasure coding similar like what you find on uh, you know, traditional S3 storage or some of the next generation storage that you find in the market. But in this instance, because of the wide scale distribution that they have, they need to tolerate extreme amount of failure and storage can actually tolerate up to 29 copies of the 80 data failure. So what it simply means is they can tolerate 28 copies and 29 copies and still rebuild the data set with whatever says left. This is pretty damn impressive for a distributed storage subsystem. So storage is a little bit like BitTorrent's concept for data. So you can have little, little chunks hosted by 80 different people. And when the time needs, it start pooling data from 80 different uh, sources. At the same token as well, when there's a failure, you have all these other chunks helping repair and rebuild that particular failure. So if you're still with me and still interested, the next part, I will show you how we configure this on our network. 
In my instance, I've configured it to run directly on my NAS, but you can actually run it on a Windows box, a Linux box, as well as a Mac connected to a NAS or any form of storage. So let's do this. So before we set up, I suggest you go to the storage IO website and go through the motion and you know, the documents are all there. So the first and foremost, I think you need to have to have fulfilled the minimum requirements here. One processor, you know, like I mentioned, 500 GB of disk space, minimally a minimum of two terabyte bandwidth. Um, once you click through all this, it will prompt you for an email address. The reason why you need an email address is so that they can send you the authentication token. So this token is almost like a certificate of sorts that to tie you into the system and to the backend. So it's very, very important that you put your correct email here. Once you have done that, you will get it in your email fairly shortly, um, a unique ID that you can actually punch in later to build that token. I'll jump into the documentation section just to get you through. So the first and foremost thing, like I mentioned, you will get a token, something like this. So it shows your email and a whole string of words. Make sure you keep that because that's important. So obviously we checked out the prerequisites. Uh, like I mentioned as well, you can do for Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, it's really up to you. Um, in my case, I actually use the NAS. So assuming that you're using a NAS like mine, um, it's actually certified to run on QNAP NAS today. For Synology, it's still very much in beta, but it seems to work fine for me. So no issues there. I'll show you quickly though. So it's very important on the Synology side of the fence, you actually need to install Docker. So if you haven't, do a search on the package center, you should find Docker and have it installed. The whole reason being because the storage application actually runs in the container. So which is pretty cool as well for those who are looking to get a little bit of hands-on of how containers work. Here's your chance again. So coming back to the prerequisites, um, I mean, you can go through the usual stuff, internet connection, obviously, because it's distributed. The next thing we need to do is port forwarding and also dynamic DNS or static IP. So if your provider provides you a static IP, great, you know, easy as that. Otherwise, you should subscribe to a dynamic DNS or there's a couple of free services recommendations here if you want to do it. Get that set up. And right down here somewhere, Yep. So it shows you how to do port forwarding. So it's simple enough on a normal router, just do port forwarding, TCP, IP port, point it to your NAS and, you know, redirect that particular port. Once that's done, so the next thing we need to do is the storage wallet address. This is how you get paid. Given that the background of the company is largely around, you know, blockchain, etc., etc., you don't get paid out in cash. So they pay you out in Ethereum. So if you do not actually have an Ethereum account, do create one. For myself, I actually bought one of those hardware tokens just to have a play with it. I actually bought the Ledger Nano S. It's pretty cool. Uh, you should check it out if you are into this whole uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum landscape. But anyway, you need to have an account for crypto before you can actually get paid. Okay, so this, is, this next part is where your authentication or authorization token gets generated. So the next part is generation of a token. You already have that token, so all you need to do now is create that certificate. I would recommend you create the certificate on a slightly more powerful system on your laptop or desktop before moving it to a NAS. Not because the NAS doesn't have enough compute power and it does take a while. So you, you run this particular command line, depending on which OS you have, and then it tries to generate a code. Once it's done, you get a similar message like that. And all you need to do now is punch in that string that you got with your email, that long string here. You then need to just move these certificates into your NAS. So let's move on to the NAS side of the thing. So as I mentioned, you will need Docker installed. I show you briefly how you do it on Synology. If you have different platforms, uh, all the instructions are here to install Docker. So installing the storage node is fairly simple. You punch in this Docker command to pull down the image from Docker with regards to storage labs. Once you pull it down, you get all these uh, little switches, but don't worry too much about it. You actually have 
this whole thing set up for you. All you need to do is just fill in the details. So for example, the wallet is your e-wallet where you get paid. This is the email address that you actually ask for that particular authorization key. This is the dynamic DNS or the static IP that you have pointing to the port that you want to use, how much storage you want to contribute. And then you need to have two directories on your NAS. One directory is where you keep your certificates or rather identity. So once you create this, you just need to dump those certificates you generated earlier into this and where you actually want to host the data. Once you have done this, cut, you know, just cut this out, make the changes required and punch it into the command line and you should have the service running. I'll let you have a quick look at the service. So I'm actually logged in to my NAS at the moment. If I go a sudo we pull this out a little bit so as you can see I actually have a container running on my NAS and it's been running for the last five hours and there it is so it's mapping to two ports this port you already saw this is the incoming port from the web what is this port though this port is actually the port that you use to access the dashboard so let's have a look at the dashboard so this this is how it looks like I mean obviously it has two modes light mode i kind of like the dark mode so as you can see i've run it for five hours um to date they have already consumed about 500 max is the space remaining you can actually click on egress how much data is going out and how much is being copied into um if you hover on top you can see how much is being used for repair works and how much is actually really used etc etc so it's fairly straightforward in many ways i, I kind of like the simplicity of this dash you can also check out which of those hubs or satellite that's consuming the data so you can choose east uh, asia here um, there's used up about 81 max i can go check out us central 119 max and they also give you a bit of statistic and uptime. How many times have they ping you and, and um, you know how many came back okay. So like I mentioned, if you're running QNAP, there is a whole section on QNAP here. So there's really not much to the install process. It did take me a while though having said that. I mean, I, I completely missed the part where I needed to generate a token and I had to go into the logs to kind of dig and understand why my container wasn't really starting up. But otherwise it was a fairly, fairly simple thing. Hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight of how storage and tardigrade IO works. So if you feel that you have some time and you don't mind contributing some storage and earn some cash in return, or maybe just as a side project, it's quite an interesting one. I actually had fun playing with it. As you can see, I haven't had it running for a while, so I don't actually know if I'm eventually going to get paid out or not, but maybe I'll do a return video a couple of months down the road and let you guys know. Once again, thank you for watching and till next time.